I want you to think for a moment about your last holiday. How did you get to your destination? How did you get around? Where did you stay? The transport services, accommodation and attractions we find in tourism destinations don't happen by accident. In fact, in large urban areas like New York, London or Beijing, a great deal of planning is needed to deliver infrastructure that is reliable, high quality and well integrated. The infrastructure required for tourism is either provided by government as public infrastructure or by private enterprise. It's becoming increasingly common in some parts of the world for major infrastructure developments to be funded through public-private partnerships. Infrastructure can also be organised into demand drivers and support facilities. Demand drivers create and encourage visitation to a destination. They can extend the length of stay and increase visitor expenditure. Some examples of demand drivers include convention and exhibition centres, national parks and attractions such as heritage sites, theme parks, museums, art galleries, zoos and aquariums. Yes, yeah, so with, with, the, uh, with the museum, you know, and, and the people are coming here and being blown away with it, it's growing. In fact, the museum is growing faster than we can keep up with it, so it's just expanding really rapidly. And that now is becoming a tourism demand driver. In fact, in the last couple of years, it has, it has probably starting to contribute quite a lot into the regional communities. And, uh, and I see it as, in future, getting more. Australian Agent Dinosaurs is a very funny thing. We don't drive it, it's, it's, it drives us. And that's a good, good, that means you're, doing, you're on the right track, really. Support facilities are just as important as the demand drivers. The visitor economy would not function without appropriate investment in supporting infrastructure such as hotels, airports, roads, rail and ferry networks. Unfortunately, there is often a mentality that if we build it, the tourists will come. Destinations also need to think about soft infrastructure. These are all the systems and processes that make travel possible. Examples include information, law enforcement, emergency services, financial systems, education and collaborative networks that bring together stakeholders to coordinate and support the industry. One of the most important things I find when you're building infrastructure, especially major infrastructure for a museum, anything really, but when you're really talking tourism, science, education and bring all those things together, and it, of course you've got, to, you've, got, you've got to have your core product, which we have got, dinosaurs, education, science, they're there, and the integrity that brings those together, we've got that. But it, you can't just, I mean, you could, you could just go and build all these wonderful great buildings, get, if, you could, if you could get the funding, obviously. But what would you really have? And I, I, I think the growth of an organisation like Australian Age of Dinosaurs is very important that it's growing from the inside as well as the outside. So there's no point in building all this massive infrastructure if you're not ready for it as a group, as an organisation. Now that we understand the complexity of the infrastructure needed to make tourism happen, we can start to understand some of the challenges. The first major challenge is a lack of coordination between different stakeholders. This includes coordination across different levels of government, different government departments, and coordination between different parts of the tourism industry. A coordinated whole of government approach and engagement with external stakeholders is critical. All stakeholders need a clear vision backed up by goals, strategies and performance indicators. A second challenge is that tourism is often a secondary user of public infrastructure such as roads, public transport and parks. The needs of tourists are not always considered when planning and funding these kinds of facilities. It's critical that the needs of residents are balanced with the economic benefits and needs of tourists when planning infrastructure. A third challenge is that planning, approval and regulatory barriers can stifle investment and infrastructure development. The ability of a tourism destination to attract infrastructure investment is influenced by government regulations, approval processes, incentives and taxation policies. Investors will only make a commitment to develop infrastructure if they can earn an adequate return on their investment. A fourth challenge is that the rates of return on tourism infrastructure are perceived to be low. Rates of return can be improved through microeconomic reforms, increasing industry productivity, improving access to destinations to increase demand and increasing the length of stay of high yield visitors such as business travellers. 
In some destinations, the demand for tourism is highly seasonal. For example, tourists like to visit Queensland's beaches in summer rather than winter. Better returns can be generated if the destination can develop attractions or events that will attract visitors outside the peak season. Finally, some infrastructure projects are unlikely to ever attract private sector investment. Sometimes it's necessary for governments to step in to invest in tourism for the greater public good. It's increasingly common for governments to establish tourism infrastructure funds to boost partnerships with the tourism sector and to provide incentives to business for investment in new and upgraded tourism infrastructure. These funds are needed not only for new infrastructure, but also for the maintenance of existing infrastructure. The solutions we have just discussed are by no means easy, and many of them take time to implement. To illustrate the complexity of this area, let's look at an example of just one of the suggested solutions, increasing access through transport infrastructure. The relationship between transport and tourism can be described as symbiotic. An increase in tourism to a destination puts pressure on the existing transport system. Governments respond by expanding transport infrastructure such as airports, aviation access, roads, railways and public transport. This in turn makes a destination more accessible, further increasing tourism demand. When transport development is constrained, the economic and employment benefits that may flow from the growth of tourism will be delayed and a destination may even lose its competitive advantage. For most major destinations, aviation access is a crucial element of the transport mix. Consider the example of Brisbane Airport here in Queensland. The growth of aviation traffic through Brisbane Airport has been underpinned by careful planning that is focused on attracting new airlines and more flights to Brisbane. Let's take a look at how the airport and airlines work with various stakeholders to increase aviation access. And when you talk about attracting new airlines, uh, attracting new destinations, it's all about working in first instance with the airline, not just with new airlines, but also with the existing airlines. And it's about for the airline uh, to have a business case. It's not just working with the airlines, it's also very important to work with, uh, with government uh, at three levels, so it's state, city and, uh, and federal, but also with businesses. For example, tourism businesses could be in Brisbane, could be Gold Coast, could be Sunshine Coast and even, uh, even further to, uh, to help to make that business case sustainable for the airlines. Um, on the airport side, of course, well, we can't fly anywhere without uh, the support of the airports and so regular discussions with airports when we're considering new routes and then of course when we've determined the route that we want to operate we'll go into a little bit more detail. As far as government is concerned, um, obviously on the international side of things there's the traffic rights and bilateral considerations but then closer to home there are some major factors that governments could be involved in, for example in New South Wales with the New South Wales Regional Slot Scheme whereby um, there are slots that are, have been protected for regional services. They have now run out and it's very difficult to actually launch new routes um, to regional New South Wales because those slots are actually all being used. In order to continue attracting new airlines and flights, the airport has also invested in several important infrastructure projects. Yeah, the most important infrastructure investment for Brisbane Airport at the moment is the new parallel runway that uh, will be operational in 2020. That's a 1.3 billion uh, Australian dollars investment, so that's huge. But for us it's really important uh, to have this capacity available because it will actually double our capacity. It's of course not just a runway, it's also making sure that we invest just in time in our terminal capacity, in the aprons, in the roads, the car parks, uh, and there are some very interesting investments uh, in the program as well in the, in the real estate area, like uh, new hotels uh, and, and some uh, new offices. We can see from just this one case study that tourism access, investment and infrastructure is one of the most complex and costly aspects of planning and developing tourism destinations. Successful destinations carefully manage and coordinate all of these aspects to ensure positive experiences when visitors arrive.